All right, close enough. So good morning, everybody. Um, the usual Wednesday reminder, please don't forget to add your homework to the pile. Um, I posted the solutions outside my office before class, so they'll certainly be there for a while. Um, also, just the usual reminder that your second midterm is coming up on Friday. So uh, we'll talk more about that during the last 10 or 15 minutes or so of class. Um, nonetheless, um, and then of course the homework that I assigned this week was put onto the board last time, so don't forget to be working on that. Um, none of that material is going to be part of your midterm. You know, the midterm is just through last week's material. So we're talking about air water vapor mixtures. Uh, we understand that ultimately we're going to use everything we've been covering here to solve some real life first law problems, uh, problems of air conditioning. Um, you know, problems that involve heating or cooling, problems that involve adding or removing moisture from the air. Um, these are the kind of things that we'll be beginning to talk about probably later today, um, certainly in more earnest next week. Um, nonetheless, one thing that we've seen is that we have this process that we call the adiabatic saturation process, uh, whereby if we blow atmospheric air in an insulated container across a pool of water, uh, water is going to evaporate out of the pool into the air. Um, the air is going to cool and eventually become saturated with the water vapor in that air. And then this saturated air would then leave the adiabatic saturator. Um, what we determined last time was that if we could measure or observe the temperature, not only of the atmospheric air, but also the temperature of the saturated air leaving this adiabatic saturation device, um, then that's enough to find all the other information that we might ever need. Um, the specific humidity, the relative humidity, we can use it to find other things like specific volumes or partial pressures, um, enthalpies. So that's something we covered previously. Um, additionally, we talked about the concept of a psychrometer where we have two thermometers, one with a wick on it that's wet. We call that the wet bulb thermometer. The other is just a regular thermometer, a dry thermometer. So um, as we swing the psychrometer, or if you will, as we blow air across this wetted wick, um, evaporation is going to take place. And the process, while it's certainly a different process, is very similar to the adiabatic saturation process. Um, if we can measure the temperature of the ambient air, which we do through the dry bulb temperature, and then additionally measure the temperature of the thermometer that has water evaporating off of it, um, that wet bulb temperature is essentially the same as the adiabatic saturation temperature, the temperature leaving the adiabatic saturator, uh, T2 if you will, from that analysis. So we don't really have to use an adiabatic saturation process to determine the water vapor properties or the amount of water, if you will, in an airstream. All we really have to do is use a psychrometer, measure the wet and the dry bulb temperatures, and then utilize that information to find, again, omega or phi or whatever else we need. So <coughs> this was last time. Now, we don't always have to go through that complete set of equations in order to find this data. Um, we just don't. Um, if we know intuitively that we have two properties that will allow us to find any of the other properties. In other words, if we have the wet and the dry bulb temperature and we already know because we've seen it through example problems that we can then calculate, again, omega, phi, or anything like that, why don't we just plot this data on a chart? Um, it would certainly be a lot easier to do that than for every single problem to have to go through what, as it turns out, are some rather lengthy equations, right? So that leads us to what are called well, what is called the psychrometric chart. And that's what we'll start talking about now. Okay. So often we just abbreviate this psych chart. Students will always call it psycho chart, but technically it's the psych chart. Um, the psychrometric chart allows us to find any property that we need based on knowing any two properties. Okay. Um, so basically, it's just an easy way to find data for atmospheric air. That's really all it is. Um, the psych chart presents a variety of data. And I think what I'd like to do, rather than draw my own psych chart on the board, is just show you the same one that's in the book. Oh. 
Uh, now there's actually two psychrometric charts that are in your textbook. Um, one is the SI system of units and that's figure A31. And then the other one is the English unit which is A31E. So, ooh, that's big. Um, okay, I guess I can't replace the bulb right now, but oh well. All right, so there's our psychrometric chart, and you can ignore that note about the bulb. Um, I'm actually going to attempt to talk about this and just shine this onto the whiteboard um, because I'm going to give you an example problem here in just a few minutes. Oh, but that's not exactly focused, is it? <laughs> that's no better, is it? <sighs> All right, let's try that again. <laughs> Okay, that's not fun. Well, I honestly am not sure why this isn't working. Oh, there we go. You gotta zoom in a little bit to be able to right. focus. Well, I, I I am, but it it keeps passing that point. I guess we're getting closer, closer, closer. How's that? Does that look good? All right. I can't particularly tell from way over at this angle. Um, well, it's not perfect, but nonetheless, from the distance you're looking at it, it's probably pretty good. So this is a psychrometric chart. Um, this particular chart is actually A31E English units. Um, and I'm just going to have to write some more of what's down here. Um, anybody who has their book, you can certainly follow along just by looking at a31 or A31E. Nonetheless, if we look at the horizontal axis, this is the dry bulb temperature. Okay? And if we look at the vertical axis, um, this is the specific humidity or humidity ratio. Um, the units are certainly going to depend on whether we're dealing with the British or the SI system of units. Um, and then what we would notice is that there's lines that cut through at an angle. Um, these are the lines of constant wet bulb temperature. So the dashed lines, and again, it's kind of hard to see them from this distance, um, but these dashed lines that come through here are wet bulb temperature. So uh, this actually says wet bulb temperature, but I don't think you can actually read it. So T wet bulb is along this axis. And then I would also note that lines of constant enthalpy are more or less, not exactly, but more or less parallel to the lines of constant wet bulb temperature. So um, the temperature is along the curved line. That's actually the edge of the psychrometric chart. And this straight line up here just um, represents the scale for the enthalpy. So the enthalpy is along this scale up here. And again, the lines of constant enthalpy and the lines of constant wet bulb temperature are essentially parallel to each other. Um, please note that these are actually dashed lines that represent wet bulb temperature, and there are solid lines that represent the enthalpy. So again, you'll see this as you look at this um, in your book. Um, additionally, we have lines of relative humidity. Now, before I talk about that, just a couple things to note. Um, since this is omega versus temperature, if we come all the way down to the very bottom of this chart, then the implication is that there's no water vapor, right? So if there's no water vapor right here on the vertical axis, uh, sorry, horizontal axis, this is where the specific humidity is zero, and we might just call this dry air, right? If there's no humidity, it's only dry air. So anything along the horizontal axis is going to represent dry air. And then we do know that the specific humidity 
does change with temperature, right? We know that as the temperature increases, we're able to get more moisture into that air, more water vapor into the air, if you will. Um, and as such, as the temperature increases, the maximum value of omega is also going to increase. And that's what's represented by this curved line. Um, this is actually called the saturation line. So this line is a saturation line. It basically represents the maximum amount of water vapor that can be held at any particular temperature. So I mean, if we know a particular temperature, um, we can recognize that at that temperature, when we finally hit the saturation line, that represents the maximum amount of water vapor that we could hold. If we tried to put more water vapor into the air, um, it's just not going to happen. It's just going to simply condense out. All right, so that's the saturation line. So again, that's this curved line that just runs through here. Okay. Um, and then we would note that if the air is saturated, well, then that would also imply, again, the maximum possible amount of air. Doesn't that mean that the relative humidity is 100%? Remember, relative humidity is the actual amount of water vapor divided by the maximum possible. And if the saturation line represents the maximum possible, then if the actual is the same as the maximum possible, well, we have to be on the saturation line. So anything on the saturation line means that the relative humidity is 100%. And in fact, down here, when we talked about the dry air before, if there's no moisture, then the relative humidity has to be 0%. So you would expect then that the lines of constant relative humidity are going to start at 0 and then move their way up through this particular diagram. And in fact, you can see those as curved lines here. Right? So these lines here are the lines of constant relative humidity. Okay. Um, you know, here's the 10%, 20, 30, 40, 50 until we get up to 90 and 100% on the saturation line. So data for relative humidity is here. Um, there's also data for specific volume. Okay, now we haven't really used specific volume, at least not to a large extent, as we've solved some of our basic problems to this point. But again, looking ahead, we are definitely going to be solving first law problems. As we solve first law problems, we're going to be interested in mass flow rates. Um, hopefully we recognize that in the real world there are very, very few actual mass flow rate devices. Uh, mostly they're volumetric flow devices. So most of the data we're going to see in the real world is volumetric flow rate. Well, how do you convert that into mass flow rate? You, you divide by the specific volume, right? So we're going to need to know what the specific volume is and we'll see that there's lines of constant specific volume that are these steep angled lines that move through this diagram. So for instance, um, and again, this is not particularly focused. Um, you know, these lines are the constant temperature lines. So then these angled lines here would be the specific volume lines. Okay, so specific volume data essentially runs through the diagram in this fashion. Um, you know, I'm going to try to focus that one more time, and hopefully it's not going to mess it all up. That is a little better, isn't it? Is it hugely better? Probably not. Yeah, just a little bit better. Um, so nonetheless, this is all the data that we're going to see on a psychrometric chart. And as long as we know how to use a psych chart, it's really going to make our lives quite a bit easier for us. Now, a couple of things should also be noted with regards to this, and specifically with regards to the units. Um, we've already seen, as we calculated enthalpy, that the enthalpy is going to have the units on a per unit mass of dry air basis, right? Even though it is the mixture specific volume, it's still per unit mass of the dry air. So we do have to recognize those units. Um, I'll write the units in the SI system. So this is going to be kilojoules per kilogram of dry air, right? Um, or, of course, it could be BTUs per pound mass of dry air. Um, but the point is, that this is per unit mass of the dry air. It's still for the data, uh, it's still for the mixture, but it's per unit mass of dry air. We've seen this already. Uh, the same thing also applies to the specific volume. Okay? Even though this is a specific volume of the mixture, it's still per unit mass of the dry air. So this is going to be important. For instance, if we have a volumetric flow device and we calculate volumetric flow rate, and we divide by this specific volume, the cubic meter units will cancel, but we're going to end up with 
kilograms of dry air per second. That might not make a lot of sense. I mean, here we are measuring the mixture flow rate, yet we're using a specific volume that actually gives us the dry air's mass flow rate. That's just the way the data is presented, so we have to be really clear on this, okay? Make sure um, that you continue, as I talked about last week, continue to write the mass units in the denominator, wherever they appear, and make sure you show what they're the units of, right? Is it mass of dry air, is it mass of water vapor, is it mass of mixture? They're all going to be a little bit different, right? So this is something you should also recognize. Another thing that I want to note has to do with the vertical axis. If you look at some psychrometric charts, not only is it going to have the specific humidity, or again, absolute humidity, humidity ratio, but many of them are also going to have the partial pressure of the water vapor as a function of that humidity. Now, you may wonder, well, how could that possibly be? But just go back to equation A, with the first equation that I had developed for you in the notes last week. Um, omega equals 0.622 PV over P minus PV. So as long as we know the total pressure, which is just the atmospheric pressure, we're always going to have that. I mean, we, we all have access to a barometer, right? So that data is known. There's just a one-to-one -one relationship now between omega and V. I'm sorry, omega and PV. So for any value of omega, there's only one possible value of PV. So some charts, again, are also going to show this along the vertical axis. Um, nonetheless, this is the site chart. And then there's one other thing that I believe I should also indicate with regards to the site chart. And that has to do with finding the dew point. Let's say that this was our data point. I'll, I'll just use that dot as my illustration. And I want to find the dew point temperature using this psychrometric chart. Um, can anybody figure out how, many, how we might do that? And again, think about the example problems that we looked at earlier. Um, we're taking a air water vapor mixture, we're running it through an adiabatic saturation process. Um, we're not actually changing very much. Um, eventually, it's going to cool, we're going to hit the wet bulb temperature. But during that whole process, until water vapor starts to condense out of the air, isn't it just a constant omega process? Aren't we really just moving to the left as we, um, let's say, essentially cool our atmospheric air? At some point, it's going to hit the saturation line. Isn't that our definition of the dew point? I mean, isn't that the temperature at which condensation is going to begin to occur? So all we really have to do to find the dew point is move horizontally until we hit the saturation line. So if this is my actual state point, let's just call that T dry bulb, T wet bulb, and that's my actual data point, um, all I have to do is move horizontally, and that's going to be the dew point. So we would just you know, bring an arrow down, if you will, um, and just read off the temperature, which is the dew point. Of course, alternately, we would note that when we hit the dew point, the wet and dry bulb temperatures are the same. So just as easily, we could just read the wet bulb temperature data right off the saturation line, and that's also going to be the dew point. <laughs> so this is going to be the dew point um, along these lines, right, the dashed lines that are parallel to the enthalpy lines. So nonetheless, either way you want to do it, it's pretty easy to find the dew point. Okay. Just follow the horizontal line. In other words, constant omega until you hit the saturation line. At that point, you've hit the dew point. That's really all there is to it. Okay, so th this is again something you'll have to do. Now, please note again that it's a lot easier to use the psychrometric chart than it is to use the equations. Um, I always have students that just can't get past using the psych chart. They, they, for some reason, can't figure it out. Uh, and then I'll give them a problem on an exam, and instead of taking you know, five minutes because you just pull the data out quickly of your figure, you know, it might take 20 minutes to do all the calculations, look up data in your water tables or steam tables. Um, you know, so you should all get comfortable with the psychrometric chart. Now, one caution I have to give you on the psych chart. Every psych chart 
is generated at a particular atmospheric pressure. Um, the standard psychrometric chart, like tables, I'm sorry, figures A31 and A31E, are for standard atmospheric pressure. In other words, 101.325 kilopascals or 14.696 psia. So if you have a problem at those standard atmospheric conditions, then you should use the psychrometric chart for sure. On the other hand, if you have a problem where you have a different pressure than the standard atmospheric pressure, you need to find the appropriate psych chart. Um, I may end up finding one for you and giving it to you, let's say, on your final exam. Um, or you may just simply recognize that without that psych chart, but at a pressure different than standard atmosphere, you'll actually have to use the various equations. So be really careful. Um, make sure that the problem says standard atmospheric pressure or 14.7 PSIA or something like that, and then you know that the psych chart is applicable. Yes? Is 100 kilopascals close enough to standard atmosphere? I would say yes. In fact, I've even noticed that, you know, even if your atmospheric pressure changes, you know, markedly, um, the data is not going to be that far off. Now, you know, maybe if your standard atmosphere is double a typical atmosphere, well, then your data is going to be off. But if we're just talking about, let's say, our atmosphere, I mean, look, here we're in Pomona, we're at 800 feet elevation above sea level, standard atmospheric pressure here is what, about 14.3? PSIA, not 14.7. If you use a psych chart in Pomona, technically it's not the right psych chart because we don't have the same standard atmospheric pressure, but the data is really close. I mean, I've run the numbers like that before and the data is so close, I would still just use the psych chart anyway. So for anything in a normal atmosphere, you can use the standard psych chart, but if you really want to be accurate, find the right psych chart for your atmospheric pressure. So any questions then just on using the psychrometric chart? Okay. Um, one other thing I want to do is talk about that specific volume. I did mention it earlier with regard to the units, but let's talk a little bit more about that. So we know that the specific volume that's on the psychrometric chart is per unit mass of the dry air. But um, if we wanted to find the actual specific volume, you know, the actual volume per unit mass of the mixture, we'll actually have to use the data from the psych chart through some calculation. So if we want to know the actual specific volume, and let's just show this in SI units, so cubic meters per kilogram, um, and I'll just put of the mix, in other words, of the air water vapor mixture, which you can call atmospheric air if you prefer. Um, we're going to have to recognize that this is the volume of the mixture divided by the mass of the mixture. Now, the volume of the mixture is just going to be the mass of the air times the specific volume from the psych chart, right? That's going to be kilograms times kilograms of air times meters cubed per kilogram. So that's going to give you the total volume of the mixture. And then the mass of the mixture is going to be the sum of the mass of the dry air plus the mass of the water vapor. And what we can do is we can just recognize that omega times ma is equal to mv. So this is going to be ma times 1 plus omega. And then in the numerator, it's just going to be ma and then times the specific volume from the psych chart. And in doing so, you can see that the air mass is going to cancel, and we get the specific volume on a unit mass of mixture as just the specific volume from the site chart, which is going to be in cubic meters per kilogram of the dry air, and then divided by just 1 plus omega. And, you know, 1 plus omega is going to be, what, this is the amount of mixture per unit mass of the dry air. So this is kilogram mix per kilogram of the dry air. And of course, you can see the dry air mass cancels, and we end up with the appropriate units. So I'll just write it one more time. V from the psych chart over 1 plus omega. And the units are going to be cubic meters per kilogram of the mix. And that's how we're going to find it. Now, I've written it this way uh, just to make sure you're aware of the units and to make sure that you're cautious. Um, you know, again, thinking forward to problems where we're going to need a mass flow rate, um, we're going to certainly have to divide a volumetric flow rate by a specific volume. 
most volumetric flow rates um, are going to be, you know, per unit of, I'm sorry, most volumetric flow rates are going to be cubic meters of the mixture that you're actually measuring per unit of time. Um, so just be really careful with the appropriate specific volume. Are you trying to find, let's say, the dry air mass flow rate? In which case, you'll take your volumetric flow rate and divide by the specific volume as identified in the psych chart. On the other hand, if you're trying to find, let's say, the volumetric flow rate not of the air, I'm sorry, the mass flow rate not of the dry air, but let's say the mass flow rate of the entire mixture, well, then you're going to have to use this specific volume, right? The volumetric flow rate divided by the specific volume on a per unit mass of the mixture basis. So again, be really careful with your specific volume data. It, it shouldn't be a major issue as long as you're being consistent. Okay. Now, I think the next thing that I would like to do is actually go through an example problem. So yeah, everything in general has been covered here. So let's look at an example. And what I would like to do for this particular example problem is find all sorts of things for atmospheric air at a particular set of conditions. So let's find the dew point temperature. Um, let's also find the absolute as well as the relative humidity. Let's find the enthalpy of the mixture. Um, let's find the partial pressure of the water vapor. Um, let's find the specific volume. Um, and this will be, actually I'm going to do this in the British set of units. So um, let's just say this is going to be in cubic feet per pound mass of the mixture. Um, and let's also find the specific volume on a cubic feet per pound mass of the dry air basis. Okay, and we're going to do this for atmospheric air. And let's say we have a psychrometer available to us. So this will be at a dry bulb temperature of 90 degrees Fahrenheit and the wet bulb temperature of 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. So this is what we're going to do. And again, I want to do this using the psychrometric chart. So you can look at an example problem from last time and see how lengthy that problem was. Now we're going to look at it here using the psych chart. And I need to erase all the clutter here. All right, so I'm going to try to focus this again. Uh, let's see what happens this time. Did it get any better? All right, well, I guess we'll just have to leave it. All right, so here's my psychrometric chart. So the only thing we really have to do is go into the psych chart at the appropriate temperatures. So I've identified here, um, you know, we know the horizontal axis is the dry bulb temperature axis. So the dry bulb of 90 degrees would be here. Um, we also know that in this particular problem, the wet bulb temperature is 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's shown along the saturation line axis. So it's up there. Um, whoops. Too far. All right. So we know the dry bulb temperature is 90. We just follow it up this way. We know the wet bulb temperature is 70. So we just follow it along this way. And there's my data point. Okay. So now just read off all the data. It's really no more complicated than that. Um, we'll start with the dew point. So we know that to find the dew point, we move vertically until we hit the saturation line. So at that point, we're now going to just come down to the bottom and read off the dew point temperature. And you know, you can see that it's going to require, let's just call it a visual interpolation or just an estimation, if you will. Um, it's a small diagram. The lines are very, very close together. It's, it's not always easy to figure out exactly where you are. 
Um, but nonetheless, as I look at the point where I hit the horizontal axis, it appears I'm about 10% of the way between 60 degrees and 65 degrees. So I'm just estimating this at about 60 and a half degrees. Now, when you look at it, um, your numbers might be a little bit different, right? I mean, you'll have a straight edge. Maybe your straight edge is not going to be quite as parallel as it's supposed to be to the line that's shown. Um, you know, maybe you're going to miss by a little bit, maybe as you move horizontally over. Again, maybe your straight edge isn't completely straight and you're going to miss by a little bit. As long as the numbers you use for your problems are close to the ones that I've used, you'll still get full credit on any problem you might solve. But nonetheless, so we have the dew point temperature and we found that using the appropriate method. Um, now let's just start reading off the other data. So to find the humidity ratio, or again, specific absolute humidity, we just move across this way, and we simply read the value of omega off of the vertical axis. Now, this too is going to be a little bit challenging. Um, I mean, you have a line of 0 0.011, and your next line is 0 0.012. And as I estimated, about 20% of the way above 0 0.011 towards 0 0.012, so I estimated at about 0 0.0112. And this would be pounds mass water vapor per pound mass of dry air. Yes? Can we read off the uh, temperature off the, uh, the top of the curve? Uh, like, so when you're uh, writing the temperature for the viewpoint? Yes. Oh, yeah, you, yeah, you could have done that too. Um, right, so you, you either go down to the horizontal axis or because the wet and the dry bulb temperatures are the same for saturated air, which is where you are at the dew point, then yeah, you can just read this, read this number right here. In fact, you'll see that this is 60 and this is 61, so we're almost exactly at 60 and a half. So either way you want to do it, you'll get exactly the same results. Um, by the way, if you do it both ways and you don't get the same results, then clearly you've not read the figure properly. So you may just want to do that at least once or twice as you're learning to use the chart. Just make sure you're getting the same results, both from the dry bulb temperature line as well as the wet bulb temperature line. All right, so there's that. So um, we have our value of omega. I'll just put a big circle around it. Um, we've already found our dew point. Maybe let's put a circle around that too. Um, now let's find the relative humidity. So, you know, you can see right here, um, we're most of the way up between 30 and 40 percent. Um, again, according to my estimation, it looks like we're about 80 percent towards the 40 percent line from the 30 percent line. So I approximate that as about 38 percent. So the relative humidity is 0 0.38. So we have that information. Um, let's now find the enthalpy. So Please note that when you read off the enthalpy, uh, don't make the mistake, which I find is a common mistake. Don't read off the enthalpy at the dew point. Um, that's a completely separate issue. This is your data point, so you're reading the enthalpy off the appropriate lines, the lines that are parallel to the wet bulb temperature lines. And you can see that this is really almost right on um, one of these lines, which is the line for 34.0 BTUs per pound mass. So I just read off the enthalpy right here. So we just kind of continue up. And you can read off the appropriate enthalpy value. So there's your enthalpy. Um, again, 34 BTUs per pound mass of the dry air. Um, now, let's do the specific volume next. Uh, we know that we're going to have to find the specific volume on a per unit mass of dry air basis directly from the site chart. And then we're going to have to modify it as described earlier to get the specific volume per unit mass of the mixture. So Again, we know the specific volume are these sharp angled lines that come down this way. And um, it would appear that we're almost exactly on this line, which is 14.1 cubic feet per pound. So there's the specific volume. Okay. And then that's on a per unit mass of dry air basis. Now, can you guys read that? I know this is, no, can't. Okay. Um, I'll just rewrite them. V equals 14.1 cubic feet per pound mass of dry air. So I'll just rewrite all these terms. Um,
All right, so maybe that'll be a little bit easier. So now that we have the specific volume on a per unit mass of dry air basis, all we have to do is divide by 1 plus omega. So the specific volume is the specific volume from the site chart over 1 plus omega. So 14.1 cubic feet per pound of dry air. And then 1 plus omega is 1.0112. And this would be pounds mass of the mix per pound of dry air. So we can just use our math. And we end up with 1.3, I'm sorry, 13.94 cubic feet per pound mass of the mixture. Okay, so there's a specific volume on a per unit mass of the mixture basis. And then I guess the last thing is to find the partial pressure of the water vapor. Now again, in your textbook, it doesn't actually list that, uh, but it's easy to do. Uh, we know that PV, for instance, is just the relative humidity uh, multiplied by PG, and PG, of course, is the saturation pressure at the actual temperature, which is 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. So we know that the relative humidity is 0.38. Um, we also know that PG can be found just by going into table A4. So this is 0 0.6990, um, and this is in PSIA. Okay. So again, from table A4, 0 0.6990. So this just gives us the partial pressure of the water vapor as 0.2656 PSI. Okay. Now, we could have found it differently. Um, again, we could have used equation A in your book. Um, and um, you know, you just go through the math. And I'm sorry, it's not equation A in your book. It's equation A in your notes from last week. Um, you know, that was the equation that I mentioned earlier, right? 0.622 PV over P minus PV. So that's equal to omega. As long as we have omega, um, we would assume in this problem that we have standard atmospheric pressure, and therefore we could find the value of PV. Now again, you may want to solve using more than one method just to verify that the results you calculated are going to be consistent using the different methodology. They may not be exactly the same. I mean, again, there's some error in reading the psych chart, but they should be pretty close. So any questions on this example? All right. So please note, finally, that you are not going to be allowed to use a psychometric chart on your midterm Friday. Um, we just started talking about that today, and it's not something you'll do. So please make sure that you are prepared on your midterm to solve problems using those various equations. Um, I'm not really yet ready to start talking about the midterm, but um, nonetheless, I just want to point that out now. So again, any questions on this? All right. Um, so the next thing that I'd like to do then is begin talking about air conditioning. Now really, it doesn't say that we're going to start talking about air conditioning until next time. Well, really it would be Monday because of your midterm, but you know, I've got an extra 10 or 15 minutes or so today. Um, I'm going to start talking about that anyway, um, just as a prelude, if you will, to air conditioning. Um, we will c cover some of the basic equations, but I have not even assigned any homework dealing with air conditioning this week, so I'll just consider this a preview. So we're now in the next section of our book. 14.6 uh, called air conditioning. And as has been mentioned repeatedly now, it's all about comfort, right? But we know what's comfortable for us, right? Not too hot, not too cold. That's comfortable for us, right? Um, usually we're comfortable, what, between maybe 68 degrees Fahrenheit and you know, mid-70 degrees Fahrenheit, 
If you're much above that, it's just too hot. If you're much below that, it's too cold, right? So when we're dealing with air conditioning, we're going to have to be aware of comfort levels. And if it's too hot, we're going to have to provide some cooling. And if it's too cold, we're going to have to provide some heating. Um, on the other hand, we also don't like air that is too humid. Okay, uh, we all recognize that if the humidity goes up, even if the temperature is not particularly high, it's sticky. It feels uncomfortable, and that's just because our body can't cool itself as effectively, right? I mean, you perspire, um, your sweat evaporates off of your skin, and that's what keeps you cool. Okay? If it's too humid, you can't evaporate into humid air as, as quickly or as easily, right? We, we know that. We know that um, in humid air, the evaporation isn't going to be as effective because there's already too much moisture in the air, too much water vapor in the air. So um, if it's too humid, then we can't keep ourselves cool. That's uncomfortable. Um, or if it's too dry, right? So not too dry. Right? We know that if the air is dry, it, it affects our body. It affects our skin. Some people have nosebleeds if the air is too dry. Um, but these are the things we're going to think about when we're dealing with comfort, right? Not too hot or cold, not too humid or dry, um, which basically implies that we have to, in air conditioning processes, have some means of cooling, have some means of heating, um, have some way to remove moisture from the air, have some way to add moisture to the air. That's really what air conditioning processes are all about. Now, with all this in mind, let's look at some of the basic equations. And like we've seen previously, at least with regards to adiabatic saturation, um, we're going to look at both mass as well as energy balance equations. And we're going to have to look at the mass balance both for the dry air as well as the water vapor component. So let us begin with mass balance. So these are our mass balances. Um, let's just let I equal the inlet and E equal the exit for any one particular process. Um, it doesn't even matter what the process is. Uh, let's just say that this cloud represents some sort of an air conditioning process. And we just have some inlet and exit. Um, of course, it is possible that we have multiple inlets and multiple exits. Um, there's nothing in air conditioning that says we can only have a single inlet or a single exit. Um, I mean, look at the adiabatic saturation process, right? We have two inlets. We have water vapor coming in with the mixture with the atmospheric airstream. We also have water vapor coming in by evaporation off of that pool. So we could certainly have multiple inlets, and it's even possible to have multiple exits. If you have a process that removes humidity from the air, not only are you going to have some moisture in the air leaving this process, but you'll have some moisture that condenses that then leaves the process as well. Um, you're probably all familiar with this. Um, maybe you're not, but um, if you look on your air conditioner at home, um, specifically look at the devices called the evaporator, uh, there's always going to be a little tube that comes out the side of the evaporator that goes into the drain of the building. Um, in your home, it's just going to go into your plumbing, well, into your sewage system. Um, we need that. Um, as you cool air, it's very possible that we're going to go beyond the dew point and that water vapor is going to condense out of the air and that liquid water we have to get rid of somehow. So again, we could have multiple inlets and exits. So as we start with the math balance, um, let's look at dry air first. And we would note that the sum over all inlet streams of the mass flow rate of the dry air at the inlet, well, it has to equal the sum over all exit streams of the dry air flow rate at the exit. Okay? We're, we're not accumulating dry air. We're not diminishing dry air. Right? Whatever dry air comes in will eventually have to go out. So that's one equation associated with the dry air. And again, this leaves open the opportunity for multiple inlets and exits. Uh, frankly, for most problems, we're not going to have multiple inlets and exits. We'll have one. But this at least leaves that possibility. And then we also have our mass balance associated with our water stream. So we could have multiple inlets. So the mass flow rate of water coming in. And this has to equal the sum over all exit streams, the mass flow rate of water at the exit. Now, I, I'm using W for water here. But we would note that for many processes, it's actually water vapor that's coming in or going out. Sure, there are situations where we're going to actually squirt water into the airstream to make it more comfortable. I mean, you know, you've been out um, in the middle of the day at some venue, usually where they 
sell beer and play loud music. Um, but there's little spray nozzles all over the place, right? And it just adds moisture to the air in order to cool it. So certainly it's possible that we'll have water or even water vapor that's coming in. So let's just note that is that if we have water vapor, and this would be either in or out, um, then just keep in mind that the mass flow rate of that water vapor is related to the mass flow rate of the dry air, right? It's just omega times the mass flow rate of the dry air. So we'll note that that's equal to omega times the mass flow rate of the dry air. Remember, omega is the ratio of the water vapor to the dry air. So you multiply it by the dry air flow rate, and that's the water vapor flow rate. So we could certainly plug these in above Um, but I'll just say as needed. Okay. Um, we'll have to look at the individual problem, and there's many different types of problems, and see you know which streams have water vapor coming in with them or exiting. In fact, quite frankly, um, we're always going to have some inlet and some exit, so there's always going to be some water vapor that comes in with the atmospheric air, and there'll be some that leaves with the atmospheric air as well. So that's your water vapor mass balance, or water mass balance. And now let's look at our energy balance. And again, when we use the word energy balance, we're really just talking about our first law for a steady flow process. Um, and like we've done so many times, we're neglecting kinetic and potential energy changes. You know, we're keeping the kinetic energy low because we don't want erosion on the inside of all our devices. Um, there's no significant height change in a simple heat exchanger, so there's not going to be any potential energy change. These are passive devices, right? There's no work associated with them, so there's no work terms. So it turns out that in our first law, all we have is heat transfer and enthalpy change. So the basic equation would just be the rate of heat into the system and then we add to that the sum over all inlet streams of m dot i h i. Right? That represents the inlet. And then this will have to equal the rate that heat is rejected from the system, or the rate of heat out. And then plus the sum over all exit streams of m dot e h e. Okay? So this is our energy balance. And from these equations, both for mass and energy balance, we should be able to at least begin to look at all these different processes. You know, if we don't have the right temperature, if we don't have the right amount of humidity, we'll have to figure out how we're going to use this equation to consider the heat that's added or the moisture that's added to our particular process. Um, let me also make a final note here. Um, we know that there's a relationship between the mass flow rate and the volumetric flow rate, right? We, we've seen this equation already. Um, again, we would note that this is the specific volume of the mixture, but <coughs> per kilogram of dry air, right? Um, but one would also note that in some problems, we don't even specifically know the volumetric flow rate. Sometimes we just know the velocity and the area. I mean, if we have a, a big duct, um, we could very easily put an instrument in that duct, and we can very easily measure the velocity. Um, we can measure the duct so we know its area. It's not always convenient to have a volumetric flow device, but certainly we can measure velocities pretty easily. So just remember that the velocity times the area is going to be the specific volume, right? Um, cubic feet. Um, oh, did I do this right? Mm -hmm. This is the velocity. Yeah, that's right. So velocity in meters per second times square meters is cubic meters per second. So that's the right term. Um, please note that this is my cursive letter V, right? That's velocity. It's not the same as this pointy lowercase v, which is specific volume, right? So we'll just finish up the equation. And this is another way that we can relate the specific volume to the mass flow rate. So again, read your problems carefully and make sure you're using the right equations. So again, we actually have the basic equations that we're going to need, and now we need to start looking at individual processes. So again, we have our mass balance equations, we have our energy balance equation, and now let's begin by looking at some simple heating and cooling processes. Okay. 
So we're going to look at these together because they're really quite similar processes. So let's say we have some sort of air conditioning system. Let's just show it as if it were inside a duct. And let's note that we have flow through the system. Um, I'm going to use numbers now instead of just I's and E's. Um, so I'm going to let 1 equal the inlet and 2 equal the exit. And since we're dealing with simple heating and cooling, um, there's going to be some device that allows us to exchange heat. I'll just call that Q dot. Um, and it, it'll be either in or out. Um, it's rarely going to be both. I mean, why would you spend all that energy to remove heat from some airstream and then spend more energy to put some of that heat back in? Um, although, frankly, in some building air conditioning systems, that's exactly what they do just to balance out the temperatures, but it's not very efficient. Nonetheless, this is the basic description of the simple heating and cooling process. And when we talk about simple heating and cooling, we will note that there's no moisture uh, which, by the way, is just another name for water vapor, right? Uh, there's no moisture added or removed. Okay, So that's what we mean when we're talking about a simple process. So first of all, let's just look at our mass balance. Now, if we're not adding moisture and we're not removing moisture, right, then that means that omega has got to be the same during the entire process, right? Um, the amount of water vapor that comes in is the same as the amount of water vapor that goes out. The amount of dry air that goes in is the same as the amount of dry air that goes out. So we would note that for the simple process, omega is a constant. Okay, so in other words, omega 1 has got to equal omega 2. Okay. Um, let's also note, based on our mass balance equation, um, and specifically I'm looking now at the dry air, um, well, the dry air going in is the same as the dry air that goes out. So we can also note then that the mass flow rate of the dry air at 1 equals the mass flow rate of the dry air at 2. Okay. Um, by the way, when I described a simple process and just said omega 1 equals omega 2, you know, that probably was logical to you. It could very easily just be derived from this equation, right? Since we're not adding or removing moisture, we only have water vapor. So we could basically write that omega 1 m dot a at 1 equals omega 2 m dot a at 2. Of course, m dot a is the same, so therefore omega 1 equals omega 2. So we could think about it logically to make this conclusion about omega, but we can also use the mass balance equation for water. So this really does come from the mass balance for water. Um, this is really the dry air mass balance. Okay. So those are equations that we're going to use. And lastly here, I would just note that since the mass flow rate of the dry air is the same, both in and out, well, let's just call it m dot a. So now let's look at our first law and let's specifically look at heating and then we'll specifically look at cooling. Okay. So for a heating process, there's obviously no Q dot out, right? So there's only Q dot in. So we would simply write this as Q dot in and then plus, um, well here we would have the mass flow rate of air at 1 times the enthalpy at 1. And then this has to equal the mass flow rate of the air at 2 times the enthalpy at 2. Um, by the way, if we go all the way back to this basic equation here, it's a little bit misleading. In fact, I'm going to add a subscript to it. Um, remember that the enthalpy from our site chart is for the mixture. Even if we use calculations, it's still for the mixture, but it's per unit mass of the dry air. So this really should say, the air mass flow rate coming in, just to be consistent with the units for the enthalpy term. So it's not incorrect. In fact, I would say it's probably a little more clear if we just put an m dot a at the inlet and an m dot a at the exit, just so we get our units right. Of course, you're going to keep track of your units anyway, so it's not going to be a problem. Um, anyway, 
since m dot a1 equals m dot a at 2, we could then conclude that q in is just the mass flow rate of the air times h2 minus h1. So that's the first law for a heating process. And for a cooling process, we'll just have m dot a1 times the enthalpy at 1 equals the rate of heat out plus m dot a2 h2. Okay. Um, now again, we could just rearrange this. And we would note that the rate of heat that's leaving the system is just going to be the air mass flow rate and then times h1 minus h2. So this is the equation we'll use. This is our first law equation for a simple um, cooling process. Okay. Um, lastly, if we were to show these on a psychrometric chart, uh, they're just horizontal lines, right? Um, there's no change in the specific humidity, so we can only be moving horizontally. So on our psychrometric chart, basically, if we have a cooling process, we're moving horizontally from point one to point two. Right? On the other hand, if we have a heating process, well, we're still moving horizontally, but now we're moving to the right from point one to point two. Okay. So analyzing a simple heating or simple cooling process is really quite straightforward if we have a psychrometric chart. All we have to do is go to the psych chart and have a nice straight edge that we have the ability to hold steady and horizontal, and then just simply move from point one to, to point two. You can read off the enthalpy terms at points one and points two, and for any mass flow rate, we can determine what is the rate of heat, either in or out, that has to be provided to the system. Now, where does that heat come from, or where do you remove that heat to? Well, the heat would come from a furnace, probably, or it might come from a heat pump refrigeration cycle, right? Um, where would the cooling come from? Well, again, from a refrigeration cycle. So we are not specifically talking about refrigeration cycles right now. We've talked about that already, but certainly you can see how it's now related to the larger world. Anyway, that's all the time I have for now. Now I want to just talk a little bit about your midterm exam. So uh, first though, any questions about this material that we've just talked about? All right. So a little bit about the midterm. Um, first of all, some of this I've already mentioned because I tend to repeat myself a lot. Um, the midterm can cover anything from section 10.4 right through 14.3, which is last week's material. Um, so basically, the ranking cycle with, with all of its variations, I mean, uh, I believe 10.4 dealt with the reheat ranking cycle, but you know, we also talked about the um, regenerative ranking cycle and then the cycle with both reheat and regeneration and of course the non-ideal cycle to boot. So uh, certainly you want to be comfortable with the non-ideal ranking cycle uh, of any type. Um, we also talked about refrigeration cycles in chapter 11, um, then thermodynamic property relations from chapter 12, um, gas mixtures from chapter 13, and then just the basics of air water vapor mixtures through last week. So it goes through section 14.3. Um, there will be three problems on the midterm exam. One of them will be a little bit longer than the others, but you should be able to do them all in the time allotted. Um, and again, it could be anything from those sections that I just mentioned. Um, the test will be closed book um, and closed notes, except for the three by five note cards that you're all allowed to bring with equations and diagrams only. So please make sure you have that prepared. Um, again, equations and diagrams only. Um, no psych charts, please. That's not allowed on this exam. So don't try to put a little psych chart on your card. It's just not going to be necessary or allowed. Um, also, let me note that any problem I might give you that deals with thermodynamic property relations, I will give you the appropriate differential equation applicable to that problem, whether it's the Clapeyron equation, whether it's a Maxwell relation, um, whether it's just one of those odd multi-variable partial differentials that relates entropy and enthalpy and internal energy, et cetera, et cetera. Whatever the problem is, I will give you the equation. So please don't clutter up your note card with any of those thermodynamic property relations. It, it's not going to be necessary. Okay. Um, also, of course, you can use the thermodynamic property table handout, which is just from the appendix of your textbook. If you have your own property table uh, booklet or handout, you can certainly bring that if you want to. But I do have enough for the whole class. So that's the basic 
format of the exam. Um, are there any questions, just questions in general about material, homework problems, example problems, um, just anything that I could do to uh, make your midterm go a little more smoothly on Friday? Wow. I guess you're all going to get A's and B's then, right? Um, well, I mean, if there's no questions about anything, then um, I'm not going to keep you. So, last chance. Ah, uh, one question, yes. For specific it's, it's, you want us to what, use the room temperature data? When we've dealt with, um, well, okay, when you're talking about specific heats, um, are you talking about a particular cycle? I mean, honestly, we didn't really use specific heats except for the gas power cycles. Um, once we got to the ranking cycle, we only used our steam tables, well, steam and water tables, A4 through A7. Um, when we dealt with refrigeration cycles, we were only dealing with you know, A11 through A13, the refrigeration tables. Um, so with regards to ideal gas constant specific heat, that, that's not really applicable. I, I guess you're probably thinking about Brayton cycles or Ottawa diesel cycles or something like that. Um, and certainly for air water vapor mixtures, we're only dealing with ideal gases with constant specific heats and because of the very limited temperature and pressure range in the environment, yeah, using that specific heat data at room temperature is appropriate. Yeah. So I'm not sure what your specific question was regarding that, but there's a nice complete answer anyway. Um, any other questions regarding any of this material? Okay, um, just a reminder that I have office hours Friday for the hour right before your midterm. So if you have questions, you will have one other opportunity to come see me. Um, anyway, um, solutions have already been posted. I posted them right before I came here. So you have access to that now. I'll see you all on Friday.